a woman who remembers every single day of her life. Your jaw drops and you think, this woman ain't faking it. Soldiers haunted by the one day they can't forget. About the most horrible things one can imagine in life, they've experienced it. Scientists penetrating the secrets of our most precious mental ability. He looked under the microscope and he said, oh my gosh. You're doing great, keep going up. Of all the things that our brain does, more important than language is more important than anything else. Because if you don't have memory, you don't care about anything else. Investigating the mystery of memory. Funding for the mystery of memory is provided by the AstraZeneca Nobel Medicine Initiative. Memory is everything. It allows you to remember where you were yesterday, what you had for breakfast, whom you talked to last week. Memory is the glue that binds our mental life together. It, it allows you to have continuity in your life. But sometimes memory works in ways that are hard to understand. Jill Price is a 43-year-old woman in Los Angeles. If you ask her about any day of her life since she was 12, she can instantly tell you what happened. Normal people, years go by and things fade. And for me, years go by and they're just as strong. Like right now, we're sitting and we're talking and I'm in totally in the present moment, but I always have a split screen in my head. I always have this loop of memories that are just running, not having to do with anything, just random, nothing in order. They're just always running in my head. If you were to give me a specific date or if I were reading something and I saw a date, then I could automatically just go back to that day. Let's say May 14, 2009. I will, I see it was Thursday. On that night, I was sitting at a red light and somebody crashed into the back of my car. I see as if, as if I were actually, it was actually happening again. Not only do I remember my life, but if something touched me emotionally, it has now become part of my life. What about Mount St. Helens? May 18th, 1980. Beirut bombing. That was October 22nd, 1983. And Lockerbie? Uh, December 21st, 1988. When I say this, people are like, oh, I would love to have a memory like that. Well, in some respects, yeah. But to not be able to forget all the bad stuff. Let's take my husband's death. He died four and a half years ago. It's like it was yesterday. This is my life. And this has like reached the deep core of who I am. So it's not a sideshow. It's not a joke. It's very serious. And that's why, you know, I have these doctors who are studying me. Why did you contact me? Because I wanted to find somebody who could maybe tell me why I remember everything. In 2000, hoping to find out why she remembers the way she does, Price contacted James McGaw a memory researcher at the University of California at Irvine. When a subject, Jill Price, uh, first came to us, I had to be skeptical. I mean, that's what science is about. But with Jill, it's really, frankly, fairly easy. You start to probe her memory, and it's not long before your jaw drops and you think, okay, this woman ain't faking it. How do you know it's a Monday? Because I just do. Because I just do. She's always accurate, always accurate. And how does she do it? She said she does it because she can remember the day. She doesn't calculate it, she just knows what day it is. On one occasion, we asked her to please give us the uh, dates of the last 20 Easter's. And she did that with one error and then corrected it. And she's Jewish. McGaw and Cahill had never heard or read about anyone with a memory like Price's. But since they started working with her, they've identified and studied five other people in the United States with a similar kind of memory. 
it began to become clear to us that what we have here is a phenomenon. I like to put it this way. You're looking at a brand new chapter in the book of memory. McGaw and Cahill have taken brain scans of Price and the other subjects. What we've done is to examine the brain scans to see what the structure of the brains of our subjects who have this ability looks like in comparison with controls that do not have this ability. And we have identified some brain regions that are remarkably larger than those of the controls. We're still in the early stages of this, but we have some very promising findings. What would you like to ask me? Um, when are you going to tell me what's going on in my head? <laughs> I've been waiting for nine, I've been sitting here for nine years. The challenge facing McGaw is trying to understand what might be happening in a biological organ of unparalleled complexity. The brain is so complex, in fact, that its basic workings were not understood until a little more than a century ago. What we know today about memory, about the function of the brain, is all based on what people that nobody has ever heard about did. Two of those people were intellectual adversaries whose painstaking studies opened the door to modern brain science. The story began in 1873 when one of them, an Italian doctor named Camillo Golgi, made an accidental discovery. He was a country physician. He was an unsophisticated guy and he was tinkering around in his lab, which happened to be in his kitchen. <laughs> As the story goes, he uh, mixed up some chemicals and threw a little bit of brain tissue into a jar. Then he came back and he looked at it and he saw for the first time what individual nerve cells actually looked like. He discovered completely by accident a method for staining nerve cells. Before Golgi, scientists could only see part of a nerve cell, which is also called a neuron. But they couldn't see its long fibers that carry messages to other neurons. With the Golgi stain, he could see the entire neuron all the fibers, the long ones, the short ones. So now he could see this three-dimensional appearance of the neuron, which nobody had ever seen. Golgi thought what he was seeing supported a leading theory about neurons, that they were all physically connected to each other. The fibers of the neurons all intermingled. And when Golgi looked at this, it looked like a net. If you hung a fisherman's net up on a tree and spread it out, it would look like one giant continuity. But Golgi's stain had a flaw. When applied to a tissue sample, it only showed a tiny percentage of the neurons that were actually there. The flaw would be remedied by a young Spanish doctor named Santiago Ramoni Cajal, the man who would one day become Golgi's rival. His very first experience seeing neurons with the Golgi stain in 1887 changed the course of his life. He looked under the microscope at this and he said, oh my gosh, this method can solve the greatest problem of our century in neurology. How do nerve cells in the brain interact with each other? Cajal figured out how to improve Golgi's method so that he could see a great many more neurons. The 36-year-old doctor got hooked on the brain. He claimed he worked 15 hours a day, six days a week. He dreamed about nerve cells. He was just essentially manic when it came to his work. And so within a period of about 15 years, he looked at every known part of the brain. To show his fellow scientists what he was seeing through the microscope, Cajal made pen and ink drawings. It was a talent he had first developed during his tumultuous boyhood. Cajal uh, was essentially, today we call him a juvenile delinquent. He was out uh, making slingshots and shooting stones at old ladies. So he actually was a rebel. He is probably the only Nobel laureate 
who spent several days in jail when he was 11 years old. He built a homemade cannon and fired it at a neighbor's garden wall. Well, the man who uh, was working in that garden took great exception to this, and with Cajal's father's approval, the constable took him off to jail. As a teenager, Cajal's greatest passion was drawing. His love of art gave his father an idea about how to turn the boy around. His father was a physician, and he persuaded his son to come and help him teach anatomy to the medical students and to make drawings of the dissections so that they could do a textbook of anatomy in Spanish. And he got interested, you know, as a teenager, actually in medicine and got a little more serious. And uh, the rest is history. Cajal's drawings of the stained brain tissue were intricately detailed. You see a black cell, all of its fibers sticking out here in this light yellow background and the sharpness, the distinctness, and the beauty of it is just fantastic. Cajal's voluminous observations led him to conclude that Golgi's net theory was wrong. He did the same thing uh, Golgi did, and he came to exactly the opposite conclusion of Golgi. Cajal hypothesized that nerve fibers never are continuous with each other. There's a gap between the two of them. Cajal said there's a clear ending to the cell, and there are special sites of contact, and only at that site of contact does communication occur. Fundamental difference. Cajal published reams of data which supported his theory, known as the neuron theory. During the 1890s, it began to eclipse Golgi's net theory, which Golgi resented. But in 1906, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded jointly to Cajal and Golgi in recognition of both men's contributions. The Stockholm ceremony was the first and only time the two ever met. Golgi spoke first and shocked everyone. Golgi got up and was pretty in your face uh, to Cajal right, I mean, right at the ceremony, uh, basically saying he's right, Cajal is wrong. And I, <clears throat> there must have been kind of an awkward feeling in the room at the time. I can almost hear the audience going, oh, you know, when Golgi uh, stuck to his idea. But the next day, when Cajal gave his speech, he praised Golgi's contributions and called him his illustrious colleague. There's no question that Cajal was mad, he was indignant, but I think also Cajal kind of figured, you know, I'm gonna win this round. I'm not gonna only win the battle, I'm gonna win the war. And he did. Cajal's neuron theory was later proved to be right. It forms the foundation for modern neuroscience. And so this is really uh, the great discovery of Cajal, is that the communication between nerve cells takes place at this junction between nerve cells called a synapse. But what actually happened at the synapse to form a memory? Trying to answer that question has been the life's work of neurobiologist Eric Kendall. When I began, one didn't have the foggiest notion of how memory was stored in the brain. And my work and that of others showed it came, as Cajal had predicted, through changes of synaptic connections. Kendall's partner in solving the mystery? A snail, scientific name, Aplysia. This is a giant marine snail. It is interesting from a neurobiological point of view because it has a very simple nervous system. Its nervous system consists of 20,000 nerve cells. You have a hundred billion nerve cells in your brain. So this is a tiny, tiny fraction. In the 1960s, Kendall began a study of how Aplysia learns and then remembers something simple, to withdraw its gill protectively when something touches it. 